Welcome to another VO Radio Show. Uh, today we do have a special guest, Robbo and I, and that is the one and only Harlan Hogan. How are you, Harlan? Just great. How about you guys? Really well, mate. Thank you. Feeling good. good. Except for the uh, except for the flood, of course. AP's had a flood in his studio, mate, just ah. to uh, fill you in. It's always something. You know that. We have a family saying yeah. in the Hogan family, nothing's easy. And that just seems to be the, <laughs> the way the world works. Yeah, it's becoming more and more my, the norm. My, my grown sons will go, well, Dad, you know, nothing's easy. I say, well, where'd you hear that? <laughs> oh, yes. We're dry here. For Chicago, hardly any moisture at all. Well, it's usually frozen moisture, isn't it? Or going sideways. Yeah, frozen moisture. Yeah, usually this time of year. You know, we really had very little snow. It's kind of scary. But uh, I'm ready for spring. Now, the reason we got you on the show today is because um, we've been playing around with road cases. Well, both of us have been experimenting. And uh, I finally, after trial and error, have found what I believe is probably the best option I've got for a road case. And it involves your Porter Booth Pro. Great. So the reason we wanted to get you on the show to talk about it was it, because of the different ways of setting it up, I've actually played around moving the mic placement, different microphones. I wanted to get you on the show just to talk about the best way to use your Porter Booth Pro. That's good, man, because nobody does that. No, it's, that's great. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about all the years that spent in big, expensive studios here in, in the States all over the place and how much of the time the audio engineers, even in, you know, really high-end studios that were, you know, professionally done, were always tweaking and always trying different mic placements and, you know, bringing in various gobos and, uh, and bass traps. And yet, you know, with a little portable booth like we made and kind of championed, it's very hard to get people to experiment with it, right? You know, different microphones... I mean, there are some mics that are so awful, and we probably know the ones I'm talking about that, you know, it, it won't matter. But uh, mic placement, your placement, not sticking your head in the booth or being too far away, and sometimes adding. I uh, had a guy the other day that was having a, a noise problem because he, uh, and, and thank God he told me what he was doing. He was trying to record in a home that has high cathedral ceilings. Now, I don't know if cathedral ceilings means he was a man of the cloth or not, but, you know, can you think of a worse scenario? Of course, I said move, but that <laughs> wasn't an option, apparently. But in that case, uh, I told him go down to the, you know, the, the nearest do-it-yourself store and pick up a lightweight moving blanket and put it on top of the booth, and that solved it. But we wouldn't want to have that in the booth all the time because that adds 10 pounds to it. So... I know you were experimenting with things, and, and each person's different. Each mic is different. I just know if people take a little bit of time and put their headphones on and get quiet and experiment, you'll find, you know, that sweet spot where you go, that's good. That sounds great. Tell me, I know you, I forgot already what the mic uh, you did and a few other little interesting tweaks. Yeah, the way I did it was uh, I actually changed the microphone, and I used a Microtech Gefell M930, which is a... It's a large diaphragm microphone. One of the things about that microphone, it does actually have a really nice, clean top end, uh, mm -hmm. not so much of the bottom or lower mids or bottom end. So when you're in a, an environment like the Porter Booth Pro, which you know is a small environment, you're going to get that boxy, boomy sort of effect. The thing mm -hmm. about that microphone is because it doesn't have anything inherently in the microphone, uh, it balanced it out beautifully. And I did send the file off to Robbo to check it out and ask him what he thought, because it's always difficult when you're on the road and you're listening with headphones. And it came up beautifully. In fact, I, I solved the problem after all these years of playing with different things and different microphones. And to me, it worked really, really well. And the only thing I did do was I grabbed a bath towel and put it over my head. And uh, because the floors were hardwood, I just put a, a pillow on my lap. And that seemed to do the trick. It just worked really, really well. Great. I have a mental image of this. I wish I had a photo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you, you wouldn't if, want if, that. If the, if the cleaning person had walked in, <laughs> you, you have a hangover, sir? <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Actually, I was in Ronda, Spain on a motorcycle trip a few years ago, and I had all this beautiful, beautiful place overlooking a gorge and huge glass, right? Everybody's thrilled. I'm going, oh, damn. Oh, no. Because I had something I had to record. Oh, this is terrible. So I got every blanket. I could. It's the middle of summer now. It's like August in Spain, right? And I call down in bad, bad, bad Spanish and explain, I need blankets. I need blankets, lots of blankets. <laughs> I'm putting them on the glass and everything. And as it happens, the 
cleaning person came in, knocked on the door and walked in, and I was just kind of setting up. And she looked at me and saw all these blankets up on the windows, taped up with whatever tape I could find. And then, you know, obviously a microphone sitting there and some exotic looking device. And she she visibly paled and mumbled something and left. I think she thought I was a spy. I mean, I'm pretty sure she, <laughs> who, who else would, would be, if she saw you with the bar towel, might not be good. Oh dear. But that, that's, yeah. I mean, I love to hear that. And, and also I should tell you, you have, you have gen one, right? You have the first one, I think. Yeah, I did get in very early and I, I think it, well, it must be one of the first portable booth pros. I'm not sure. I, I don't know, but it was a long, long yeah, time ago. Probably, probably, we, I bought that six years ago. Yeah. Cause the first ones, you know, we were learning. And we changed some of the structure of the PE board that's used inside. We, we were able to finally, I think after the second time, afford, find a way to do Oralex foam, which was way superior to what was in the early ones. Take, find out how old yours is. I'll send you a new one. Because yeah, they got better <laughs> as we learned more and more things about the booths. I mean, that's what happens. And, and Oralex turned out to be great. And that was a whole story in itself. So that makes a difference as well. There is that audio hood, but it wouldn't be as fleecy as the bar towel. Maybe we should include a bar towel, a free bar <laughs> towel with every port of I like it. I yes, like it. Be... You know, on the road, you just have to be a little creative. And one thing I discovered a couple of years ago, and I'm, this is embarrassing to be so stupid. Occasionally, people have said, oh, you know, I wish you included a stand. Like, you know, you're lucky to be able to record in a hotel room somewhere. Let's not, not, let's not haul around us. I would not want to haul a stand. No. I can sit down, you know, or, or perch it on top of a high boy or something. So I was in a very small hotel room out in Monterey, and there just was no place, you know, to, to perch the booth. And, you know, very pretty antiques and stuff, but in a tiny little room. And I thought, God, I don't want to set this on. And I walked into the bathroom and I came out past the little closet area and I glanced in and I thought, my, my dad used to say this to me, how dumb can you be? And this was one of his favorite phrases about his son and his, how dumb can you be? But pretty dumb, dad. Um, I realized that at least in America, there is a perfect Porta Booth Pro or Plus stand available vir in virtually every hotel room, resort room. Even the cheapest, most terrible hotel room, Andrew, that you might stand. And um, it was right there in the closet when I realized there's a scissors stand in virtually every hotel room. Mining board. Exactly. It had never occurred to me until yes, then. I went, exactly. ow, set the ironing board up, put the laptop next. I mean, it works like a charm. Yeah, so, nice. So tell us, when you were developing the Porter Booth, you were obviously testing different setups yourself. Did you find an optimal setup? In terms of mic placement within within the booth itself, and and even more than that, microphones that worked better in in the booth itself, and all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, we tried all kinds of stuff, and I was doing the same thing you do. I would send everything over to Jeff Fisher, you know, to a, to an audio engineer that I'm friends with, and also trust him totally because I lost all perspective. And I would say, okay, here's A, B, and C, mm. you know. And it was interesting how often I, I think, well, you know, B really sounded great. And he'd say, oh, nah, I like A. Why? Well, it's a little brighter and blah, 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 blah. And we, originally, I was just, you know, repurposing things. I was just doing it for me. But then I got into it. And essentially, I found that people would put the mic too far back and stick their head into the booth. I mean, that was the biggest problem. About 20% of the way back in seems to be sort of the magical spot. And then what I always do is lean my forehead right on the front edge of the booth and lean back about six inches. And for me, anyway, that usually is just right in there. And it, but you got to listen. And that's another thing. <laughs> I keep cautioning people. You need good headphones. I mean, earbuds aren't going to crack it. On the road kind of scenario to me is when you really need truth tellers. I mean, you mm. need headphones that you can believe. Um, not gaming ones because they're going to sound too bassy, you know. Now, I always fly with uh, the Bose noise canceling as there's always a kid on the plane and sitting next to me crying i don't know why that is but um <laughs> yeah, yeah oh look at the old guy there i think i'll cry the whole flight to san francisco great <laughs> um but a lot of people do you know and i mean it, it makes me laugh sometimes i travel with two sets of headphones but i want those on the plane but i would never use those working in a portable scenario because you you need to hear the noise you've got to hear the noise 
So that, to me, I think is, is a critical element. No noise canceling, you know, good, clean, very clear headphones. Because if you hear the noise, you can often mitigate it. And sometimes the noise is our friends cleaning the room next door. I find, at least in the States, that a $20 bill gets them to stop pretty easily. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> nice. could you not vacuum for a little bit? Thank you so much. <laughs> the other thing <laughs> is, if I can, I book a room with, with a terrible view. Um, you know, like a courtyard view, because there's less noise from the street, high up, away from elevators, and unfortunate happenstance, there are vending machines near your room. I found, and I'm not exactly sure why this happens, Andrew, but they have this funny tendency that when I'm recording, they somehow get unplugged and then plug back in about 10 minutes later. So <laughs> that also helps. And the other thing is the HVAC, you know, in hotel rooms, uh, generally, it's pretty noisy. That and the mini bar, which I know you always get well stocked, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But I do. I I will turn on turn off the HVAC for the, you know for the little bit of time we're recording. It makes a huge difference. And I'll unplug that mini bar. I say this from bitter experience. Be sure to turn the the heating and air conditioning back on when you're done, or your significant other may have. Uh, a serious complaint when <laughs> she or she comes back to the room and it's 9,000 degrees in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a problem uh, when I was in the, an apartment and the only place I could set up the portable booth was in sort of a little dining area near the kitchen, uh, mm -hmm. which was great, except when the fridge kicked in and the problem was the refrigerator was like a small bus and the PowerPoint <laughs> for the refrigerator was tucked well behind the small mm. bus. Uh, so I couldn't actually turn it off. So I'd sit, sit there with the refrigerator compressor going and immediately it stopped, start reading. Yeah. <laughs> I was at a thing, it actually was LA, I was at the airport that's, you know, right out by the airport and it was a yeah. political thing and had to be fixed and I was presenting and it was, you know, under all this stress and all this pressure and I was, had managed to do a 30 second commercial timed between landings. And I think that speaks to... 40 years of experience to be able to pull that off. <laughs> like, I get three words out. I got a really good one. You... <laughs> Here comes the bus. I got a great uh -huh. story that came from about 15 years ago before the days of um, recording across the internet and, and you mm -hmm. know, all that sort of stuff. I, it was, uh, I was working in Adelaide and uh, the, uh, the voice talent was in Sydney in here in Australia and um, so for, for those American friends of ours or people listening overseas, that's sort of halfway across the continent of Australia. So uh, I sent my script to this guy in Sydney and he, was reco he recorded it to DAT and sent me the DAT back. And I, I put the DAT in the DAT player and was sort of recording it into, uh, into the, the workstation I was using at the time. And he was rambling before the recording session going, oh, you know, it's about 35 odd degrees here today, Celsius that is. Um, and uh, the air conditioning is not working, so it's stifling hot, stiflingly hot in here. So if I stop or stutter or whatever, you'll have to excuse me. But that wasn't the problem I had. The problem was that during his read, you could hear the sweat dripping from his forehead onto the script. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> so, man. I so, reckon yeah. I know who that was. Do you? Uh, it was either Steve Britton or Holger Brockman. It would be Steve Britton. Ah, uh -huh. oh, so, so there you funny. go, that's sweaty that's Steve, so <laughs> sweaty Steve. Ooh, so, uh, so ooh, the the, yeah. the joys of uh, the joys of the traveling voiceover artist, then. Yeah, but think it's what how great it is not to have to spoil your vacation. Because I have people say, "Well, now, why would you do that?" I mean, I'm trying to vacation, and and there are times when yeah, you just say, "Listen, I'm I'm not available," or, mm. or you're you know by happenstance, I guess you know I do a lot of sailing and to a couple of long trips like from Tortola to Bermuda last year. Well, obviously, you're, you're not, you have no connectivity with the world, and it's kind of nice. But aside from that, it's nice to be able to be somewhere and, you know, knock off uh, an important audition or important job and not have to tie up, you know, get in an Uber or get in a, a taxi and go to a studio and pay for the studio and come back. And, you know, that really ruins your vacation. So I think, yeah, I think it's, nice that we have this ability to you know take this stuff with us as much as we can yeah um and, and back to your original question yeah we tried we tried all kinds of stuff the thing that you know i learned early on 
you tend to think you want an enclosure that cuts out as much sound, which makes mm. sense, of course, but you also want to shape the sound. That's where mm. the acoustic foam comes in. And, and you've got to use the good stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cheap junk, and that's what it sounds like. But because of the energy in that small space, it's got to breathe. It's got to be a diaphragm mm. and release the energy. And that's when we were playing around with different kinds of board and different kinds of cloth. And actually, the structure of the booths is bamboo, which is not only renewable, it's very light and very strong. You know, you can't break, even try to break a fishing rod, you know. Mm. And so a lot of those things, you know, little by little by little, you put it together and then keep adding little improvements. And it's been a, you know, a wild ride because from that, you know, started making the microphone and the headphones and all the other products that I have never, ever intending. And, and one, of, one of my little pride numbers has always been other than like when I first started out, I went and I went back to radio for a while and worked part-time at a station, you know, to make some money when I'm starting out. And also it gave me access to a free studio so I could make demos. <laughs> but other than that, I've been <laughs> the most blessed person on earth and I've never had to have a day job and I've never had to wait tables and I've never had to work retail. Mm. So I get to the point where I've been doing it for 40 years and I start this little booth thing and then the other products that I've added. And now I realize I'm in retail. How the hell did that happen? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'll do it every time. I'm, I'm dealing with, yeah, like, wait a minute. I, I was so glad I never did that. But, but yeah, it's been fun. It's, so it's let just, me ask uh, you this. We, um, we talk a lot on the show uh, about um, acceptance of remote recording by, you know, agency creatives, um, you know, directors and all that sort of stuff. It, here in Australia, it, it's still it's still sort of getting some legs. There's still, a, and Andrew will tell you this, uh, there's, there's a lot of reluctance for people who to accept the fact that the voiceover booth isn't on the same property or could be in a completely different time zone. Um, the question that comes from that for me, for you, is... Do you find that in the States? Do you find that there's a, that people will ring and go, can you do a session? And you say, oh, well, look, I'm actually on holidays, but I've got a rig with me. And they go, oh, well, look, okay, it's, it's, we'll probably grab someone else. And if not, how, how do you, how do really, you, well, two things. For, first of all, early on, I mean, people laughed. I was out in LA, uh, I guess it's about 15, 16 years ago. And they had a, a round table thing with eight or nine of us who had written books about voiceover. And at the time I had, written a couple of books and also a book about uh, a voice actor's guide to recording, realizing most voice over people had no background and they didn't need a heavy technical background, but they needed to have some basic knowledge, you know, particularly if it came from the acting side, I've sort of come from both. So that was an advantage, but you know, they don't you get a BFA in theater. They don't mention microphone placement. I mean, this it doesn't headshots doesn't even come up, you know, it's like, mm. we're going to be, painting flats tomorrow and then pretend to be trees waving in the wind and you know, all that <laughs> stuff. So um, I started talking in, in the book about a studio of your own because it be became, I thought, pretty obvious that we would start at least auditioning from home and that we could do it on, as you mentioned, Dad, a few minutes ago. We could do it on a CD later on, even reel-to-reel. -reel. I started out doing it reel-to-reel. -reel. I could work for clients who couldn't afford Chicago studio rates. They could afford me. They would pay me, but they just couldn't, you know, pay that. And uh, started out with one guy. I said, well, you know, I can do a phone pad. What's that? I will talk on the phone. I'll record at home. I'll send it. That was my first distant client. And we've <laughs> done stuff for 25 years now. Um but when I started talking about, you know, the smaller and the new, newer equipment and everything, there, there was an audible laugh from the Los Angeles community. So I, I see a time where we'll do all of our auditioning from home and maybe even finish, you know, finish recording. <laughs> and I thought, you know, okay, I'm from Chicago. We're very pragmatic. You guys are so wrong, but I'll just keep my mouth shut. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Early on, there would be some pushback, you know, well, I don't know if it'd be good. I'm just, I'm just simply say, well, let, let, let me send you a quick track, you know, using my gear and give a listen, see what you think. And uh, most times they go, oh, that's, God, that sounds great. Sure. That's no problem. Frankly, a lot of times I don't tell people I'm, I'm not in my studio and that's not to be deceitful in any way, but when, when you take people out of what their comfort zone is, they look for a problem. So usually I just set everything up. 
talk to the client. Hey, how are you? Call them. That's why Skype is great for that because you can you can call out or in and have the same phone number and they don't really realize you're not in Chicago. And 99.9% of the time, do the job. And, uh, you know, either send it via, you know, via the internet or if we're using Source Connect or ISDN and get no complaints. But, you know, I, I, you know, it's, there's a, I'm a magician. I've been into magic since I was nine years old. And there's a, there's a phrase magicians use, don't run when you're not being chased. And like that. you can see how yeah, that is, right. you know, you're doing it. Don't start running because, you know, so just, hey, sure, I can do that at one o'clock tomorrow. And, and now it's so, it's so common here that they, by and large, expect that you'll have a home studio. And, and uh, you know, let's face it, they don't have to pay for a studio. So that's, that's become part of, you know, part of the, the expectation. So you're, when you say that they don't need to hire a studio, so you're recording with them and then just sending a file to the production house? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I do very little production. I do, you know, plain vanilla audio 99.9% of the time. Mm. And it either just what I do because it's full fidelity is FTP it up to my site and then the producer or whoever I give them a password and they pick it up and they mix it and they do whatever they want to do with the tracks. And that's pretty standard for all of us. Mm. And uh, that's the way it is now. Mm. Uh, The studio's here. There's not many of them left, truthfully. Yeah, uh, and I feel bad about that. It's and I, I miss you know that's the the bad part of this is I miss all those people. I miss the engineers and the other talent. And uh, on the other hand, I don't miss a two hour drive into the city and a forty five dollar parking bill and pretty much wiping out your whole day for a job. And even worse, God forbid, it's an audition here. Unlike New York and L A, we really there's very little voiceover casting done at casting directors it's it that's pretty much just done through the agents and they get the tracks and nobody goes anywhere on camera you still have to troop downtown and put on your wardrobe and all of that stuff but it's pretty you know it's accepted i i I have pushed back i mean actually usually they say do you you have a home you have a home studio right yes i do Mm. i see a lot of uh Voice actors are proudly putting on their website, you know, what microphone they have and what preamps. And trust me, they don't care. It sounds good or it doesn't. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's the way it is. It was interesting with some of the pay for play sites when they first got going, they would say, well, don't worry about the audio quality. You can just get a $1.98 microphone and record it on your woolen sack or whatever you've got. Because if you get the job, you'll go to a real studio and record it. That didn't last very long. Pretty soon, you know, they, they not only did the talent get much better at having good audio quality, the equipment got less expensive, so you could do that. And now it's pretty important that your audio on your audition is pro level, I, you know, or you're going to lose the audition because, you know, they say, well, I like that guy's reading, but God, it's really noisy. I and mean, we can't hire him because his studio sounds bad. I mean, it is important that we have good quality audio, particularly... You know, it's such a big country and people are all over the place. And, you know, as I said, there's not that many audio studios left in a city like Chicago. You can imagine how many there are in Waco, Texas. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. 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 So, AP, I'm, I'm interested because that sort of conflicts with your experience here, doesn't it? In Australia, there is some resistance to recording from home, right? There is still resistance. And uh, um, having said that, I, it, it's only from a few probably studios that don't really like it too much. Mm. I don't know. Then maybe they like you in there. I, look, I don't know. I mean, I get that. Like mm-hmm. if I was owned a studio and no one was rolling up and I've got the client sitting there and it's like, well, where, where's the where's the talent? Oh, we, we're actually at their studio and they're coming in. It's like, well, why do we need you? Um, so that that's an issue. And I, I yeah, get that. there is that. But uh, there is but there's that. a lot of work. You know, majority of the work I do now, it's how it's changed in in the last probably six years. I've gone from maybe ten percent of the work I did was from here or from a home studio or studio at home. Um, now it's probably ninety nine percent of the work I do is done here. That's how it's changed. Yeah, me too. It's, and the clients uh, it's, are all over the world. So, and early on there was some. You know, I could understand pushback from audio engineers thinking, God, you know, this is not good for us, and it wasn't. I used to say to actors, don't talk about your, you know, I'd see this happen. The actors would come in like, hey, you know, suddenly they were interested in micro before they could give a shit, right? Okay. You know, it's a microphone. Yeah. Talk here, get about six inches yeah. away. Gotcha. Thanks. Now they're like, what is this? 
Oh, well, that's a Sennheiser 460. I have a Sennheiser. Don't, no, 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 no. Don't rub their nose in it. You don't talk about your own studio. That's dumb. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you here, I'm 99%, and a lot of that is work in the city of Chicago. And got, I got ISDN early on, and uh, my agents would try if they could. They'd say, hey, you know, Harlan's got ISDN. Could uh, we just do that? And at first there was exactly that, like, well, no, we'd really like him to come in. Fine, 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 fine. It's a job. Who cares? You know, Um, but little by little, they saw how convenient that could be. And the last eight years, they always try to not make me come downtown unless they have to. And they don't say Harlan doesn't want to drive downtown. You know, they say, hey, you know what? He's got ISDN. We could just hook up. and could be there at one o'clock. You know, most of them go for that and seem quite happy. And, uh, you know, yeah. it just, it, it saves so much time all the way around, but you're right. There is that with the producer walking in going, where's, uh, what's his name? Oh, uh, you know, he's recording yeah. from home. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's two different things. I mean, the, 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 what we've said before on many occasions is the the whole thing about a studio at home for us being talent is it's really a booth. That's, it's not, we don't do production here. We just record our right, voice exactly. and then FTP it out or send it down the line. Probably uh, the professional studios, a lot of the smaller ones will kind of disappear. Mm-hmm. Some will become really specialised. But you're still going to have to have proper post studios for, you know, big production yeah, pieces. Yeah, I think so, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. at least at least here, being in the, you know, the mid-coast, a, a lot of the ad agency people in particular – we're so used to when they'd have a celebrity or a minor celebrity or whatever that was in L.A. usually. Of course it was ISDM. Before that, it was the satellite between 2 and 4 in the afternoon. Those were trips. Um, very expensive. But they were, they, they were already used to the idea that the talent might not be there. So it wasn't quite as hard to sell. And then for me, with my corporate and political people, it's an easy sell because they, they, the corporate guys are going, this is great. I don't have to go to a studio. I can just, you know, set up my desk and tell them how to pronounce whatever it is, diethylamino ethanol and two chloroformazoic acid or whatever you would normally say. Um, they loved it because it saved them a lot of money, a lot of time. And uh, so it hasn't been, you know, a hard sell really. As one of the early adopters of the, uh, the Porter Booth Pro, that was six years ago, you were talking about being in LA 15 years ago, what mm-hmm. do you think the voiceover industry is going to look like in the next six or 15 years? <laughs> well, there's a lot of change, awful lot of, of non-union pressure. And it isn't so much whether you're in favor of unions or not, but there's, you know, the union here, the now combined sag after union, you know, has established rules and uh, rates and negotiated conditions so that the working conditions were good and we weren't asked to do things that didn't pay at least a rational amount of money and maybe even more importantly protected us from conflict problems or the the dreaded in perpetuity or you know record this for me and i'll just use it the rest of your life and as we got more and more people outside la new york chicago you have more and more people who will work for you know a flat fee and the flat fees have been just plummeting. Part of that is new people who don't realize that, you know, if that were a union job, you would make considerable money. I just saw one the other day, okay, it was for Pepsi. Okay, that's a, you know, a major brand and a major conflict. The conflict was all carbonated beverages for a year. And they wanted to pay $1,500 for Pepsi. That would have been, you know, on a union contract, probably $25,000 because it's a major brand. And so this is happening and that's, that's, that's not a good thing. And I also say I'm not anti-union by any means. We were all not union at one time. I like the term pre-union, but I hate, also hate to see, you know, new people coming on who are skilled and good and anxious to work and they're, and they're frankly getting screwed. So there's a lot that that's a lot of uh, a heavy duty thing that's going on. And I, I don't really know what the solution will be long-term. Although I do know a lot of the people who, have not been in the union, couldn't see why they'd want to join, are starting to realize, you know what, I would have a lot more protection. I'd have the possibility of health care. I'd have the possibility of some retirement money someday. You know, we have this, are you familiar with Fiverr, this site where you can go hire people to do things for yeah. $5? Yeah. And there's voiceover people on there, 
And they actually, a couple of books that came out, like how to build your career with Fiverr. You're not going to build anything with Fiverr, trust me. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the, the game is, well, it's $5 for the first job, but next time it'll be 10 No, it'll be two for five next time. Trust me. That's, you know, it's the, the way of the world. So that bothers me. I think in terms of connectivity, that's also part of it, you know, that we can, you know, if I need an Australian voice, there were people here who, you know, made made a, a good living doing various accents where you don't, that business doesn't exist anymore because we got you guys, you know, we got, you want somebody yeah. from a particular area in Spain, Psh, not a problem. So that's changed. I'm not negative about it. I think, yeah, we still we're gonna need a lot of voices for a lot of stuff. It's probably the truth is we will do more work for less money, not the other way around. And, uh, as long as there's more work and you can enjoy it and make some money, then I, I think we're fine with that. We, we'll have to wait and see, but you can see there. there's obviously a lot of technology which may affect us. The only thing about the union which I find with SAG-AFTRA is it's so complicated, and that's where yes. I think it scares a lot of people off. Because that's all of a exactly. sudden it's a $1,000 mm-hmm. job, all of a sudden it's actually, no, it's actually really 1400 because you've got your P&H, you've got your paymaster fees. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I didn't expect that. So that, that freaks them out. Yeah, no, um, I agree with you. And it, it has always been that way. It, it is complicated. But then you also do it for a while and you realize why it's complicated. And like any other, you know, large uh, organization, it's very slow to turn the ship around when it's going in the wrong direction. Um, and I'm just hoping we can be you know, rational about the rates. But I agree with you, the, the complication, because I do some stuff, you know, through Paymaster and, and my, my corporation signatory. You know, and it's it's difficult. Well, how much will it be? Well, not quite that easy. See, there's a 13-week holding fee, and then every after the end of 21 months, you can renegotiate, and you go on and on and on. And they're like their their eyes start to bleed. You know how complicated can yeah. this be? So I think yeah, I think there's a lot of streamlining that's got to be done. Some of that's happened to some degree. Yeah. You know, with the audiobook world, which is a lot of work for not a lot of money, but at least I don't say the unions were, you know, looked at that and said, well, this is what people get to do that. And our members, if they're willing to work for that kind of rate, should be allowed to work for it. Um, yeah. And SAG has been particularly good with smaller movie making. You know, they realize that a lot, a lot, a lot of members would basically cheat because they wanted to get experience on camera in movies. And there's, you know, low-budget movies that don't pay very much, but it's a chance to learn the craft and everything. A few years, they, they embraced that and said, okay, well, they came up with two rates. It's not a lot of money. One of, one of them is uh, like $90 for the day, and the other one is a portion of if there is some profit at the end. But it, it has enabled a lot of actors to work and, and enjoy themselves and make a little bit of money. for yeah, 90 bucks a day is not bad money for most people, you know, compared to working retail. So they, I think there's movements... In, in that direction, but the complication has always been just a tough sell. Well, that's something to work on in the future. Uh, <laughs> one of the other things that I did do, Harlem, which I thought uh, might be worth mentioning as well, is I don't use paper scripts when I'm away because I haven't got a printer. Um, uh-huh. I just use the iPad, and the iPad, of course, gives you just a little bit of – it takes away a bit of, bit of the bottom end is what I'm trying to get at. So that yeah. might be a tip. Don't know. Well, you put a piece of carpet on <laughs> I like <laughs> that's what we always did right i have carpet on my easel so it doesn't reflect well let's put it over that damn yeah. ipad who cares yeah you know the, I, the reflection I, I, wasn't a problem no i know i actually for a while and i didn't pursue it i thought i wonder if there's something we could put over the ipad that's sort of like a pop filter you, know, you could read it but it would keep it from bouncing back and probably there would be a way to you know kind of use that technology uh, and then you got to look at, you know, what does it cost to make that? How many of those can you really sell? And you know, sometimes you go, well, maybe not. <laughs> you know? yeah. But that could be an issue. I just, just angle it down and off to the side a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I, I still yeah. kind of like paper, you know, I, because I, I write on my scripts a lot. You know, I'll draw yeah. a happy face or a line here or a squiggle. And over the years, I've got my, if you see a script in my you go, what the hell is that? But it's hieroglyphics and I know exactly what every line means. And it's too hard to annotate for me anyway on the on an iPad, you know, and draw with my finger. And you know. Yeah. There's also that, well, I'll just delete this. 
hey, Har, you know what? That 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 second sentence sentence we took we took out. Well, put that back in. Whoa, hang on. <laughs> <Wait a minute>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Harlan. Even as a as an as an engineer, I a couple of years ago I thought oh, I'm going to go all environmentally conscious and I'm not going to print off my scripts. But I rely on my notes too much, you know, because you you go through a especially yeah. if you're doing a corporate or something like that and, and you go through and then you want to come back and want to pick up stuff, you know, and you, you'll, you know, for me, if I, if I, if there's a paragraph I want picked up, I'll put brackets around it and I'll write, you know, what I want yeah, right. um, or whatever. You can't do that on a right. screen. And, and, and if you've just done, if you just spend five minutes reading through a corporate, <laughs> you can't exactly remember everything. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I, yeah. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny when I was in college, freshman year, uh, there was a course in phonetics that I took. And I just was bored to tears. I couldn't see any, you know, the classic, who am I ever going to use phonetics? Mm. This is stupid. I'm going to be an actor. I don't need to know phonetics. And so then I start doing this business and I start doing a lot of medical and technical narration stuff. And I, I have my own invented phonetics to write things out. Mm. And every time I do it, I think, how dumb can you be? <laughs> yeah. How could I have not yeah. paid attention and learned how to do it? Thanks, Dad. Um, but I yeah. did, you know, so now I write it out. And yeah, I've, I've, I've got to do it. But I always find if it's really highly technical and difficult, it's it's the vision of all those those letters mm. that throws you off. So I, I basically write it out phonetically in my own simple way. And then I scratch out the actual thing. Because that's the intimidation is seeing it. Mm. And when you just read... What you yeah. wrote out, bingo. I couldn't do that on an iPad. I mean, I'd have to leave the booth, go in the other room, you know, okay, or buy a $100 Apple pencil, and it's, it's, it's too much boogie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to I, microphones, I forgot to answer. Things for you know, a cardioid, in, in the booth, you want a cardioid pattern for sure, and believe me, people don't even know what that is. I get people who buy my mic and say, I just started talking, you know, it sounds terrible. They're talking into the end of it, not the side. Because they've never seen a microphone that you talk into <laughs> from the side. We can laugh, but you know what? If if you have gotten in a business and you've never spent time in a professional recording studio, yeah, how would you know? Right. I can't plug my headphones in. What do you mean? Well, they, they won't fit in my in my iPhone. Well, unscrew the little thing on the end. Oh, oh got it. Right. <laughs> unscrew the quarter inch. <laughs> yeah. There's the mini inside. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. But... Wow. But anyway, a cardioid condenser. I think I think the four sixteen works nicely, really nice in the booth. Uh, and it, it, since it's built, you know, originally for location recording, I mean, it is pretty much bulletproof. And uh, you know, it's it's nice yeah. to travel with because it's you know, or or road, the road shotgun. I think is great. Mm. I think a shotgun's a good choice. But there are oh, I don't want to get into that. But there are a bunch of them out there. And then you go. You know, you're going to be in the business and you don't need, think about this, they don't need to spend $3,000 on a mic anymore, but you also don't need to spend $79. I mean, come on, really? <laughs> mm. Well, I think that's, uh, that's been very informative. I oh. think so too. We've failed it's again. Been, it's been, uh, failed again. It's been very informative. <laughs> we've, we've gone to the source. We've, we've done our research. We've spent like the last probably 10 podcasts talking about road cases mm. and we've finally... <laughs> Gone to the source. And nailed it there down. There you go. Yeah. Well, or left it sitting on an ironing board anyway. <laughs> yes. <that's laughs> <right>. <laughs> well, you know, and, and the booth idea originally I, I, I learned from a musician who had, who had made up a thing in foam core because he had to record some acoustic tracks, and, and I thought it was brilliant. And then I just started working on it, making it so it fold up and all of those things. But I found out later that in World War II, um, a lot of the BBC people, when they were recording and there were bombs going off and all kinds of stuff, would grab a box, anything they could find, and throw some mattresses in it or whatever cloth they had and stick the microphone in it and have the open side. So this idea goes back a long way. Yeah, right. But I'd never heard of that till you know, a few years ago. Well, there you go. Yeah. And I'm really happy to know that, um, that I was one of the first adopters of the Porter Booth Pro. You were Didn't early, yeah, you're early adopter. I like that. I like that. Yeah, me too. That's good. I'm going okay. to put on the wall. Yeah. yeah. He's an early adopter when it comes to wine, too. As soon as it's in the house, he adopts it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, I think, uh, Harlan, it's well and truly uh, cocktail o'clock. Indeed. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Mm. Hey, it was great fun. I'd always love talking to you guys. It's fun and 
And uh, I'll come visit you sometime. Yeah, you should do. Yeah, yeah you should. Days, Bring your porter booth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You definitely should. You'd love it. Yeah, that would be kind of embarrassing, wouldn't it? Where's your booth? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Can I borrow yours? <laughs> yeah, you do mind if I use yours. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Harlan. Always a pleasure. And um, let's get together again very soon. Okay, you got it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Cheers. The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. To polish your next audio production, check us out at voodoo-sound.com. Find professional voices simply all in one place. Realtimecasting.com, including me.